Hello, and welcome to Influential Minds, an EEI international conversation series. My name is Erin Brogan, and I'm a manager of marketing and events for international programs at EEI. Influential Minds is our virtual conversation series, which aims to discuss ideas that move the needle towards a more sustainable future with thought leaders from across the globe. Before we begin our episode today, we want to give a preview of our events this month. As we head into COP27, today we will discuss how to enact actionable change and how our actions matter. Following COP27, be on the lookout for a pre-recorded episode of Influential Minds with Jesper Broden, CEO of Inca Group, about IKEA's history and climate commitments. On November 21st, join us for a live Influential Minds episode with Eilet Fishback on her book, Get It Done, Surprising Lessons from the Science of Motivation. And on November 30th, join us for another live episode with Lori Garver, former Deputy Administra Administrator of NASA, on her book, Escaping Gravity. Today, EEI International Programs is excited to welcome Karen O'Brien, a professor of human geography at the University of Oslo. She joins us to discuss her book, You Matter More Than You Think, where she will discuss how quantum social change can help us recognize how small changes can make a big difference in tackling climate change and scaling up sustainability. She will be joined in conversation by our host, EEI Vice President for International Programs, Dr. Lawrence Jones. Throughout the session, please feel free to ask questions using the chat feature. Dr. Jones will aim to incorporate as many of them as possible into the conversation. Without further ado, I will turn this over to Lawrence to get started. There we go. Hi, Karen, welcome. Hi, Lawrence. Thanks for inviting me here today. Well, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. And again, thanks to the audience for what I expect to be a very, very stimulating conversation. You matter more than you think. Uh, a conversation occurring at a very pivotal time for the world. Uh, we're gonna be going to COP27 next week. And we thought, what a best, what a good way to start. Uh, uh, this conversation as people head into, into the COP uh, for this uh, influential mind to focus on uh, a very important topic of why do we matter as individuals and the importance of quantum social change. You know, Karen, as I was reading the book, I was struck by two quotes. Uh, the first one uh, by Dana Sahar, which you have at the back of the book that says, we actually live in a quantum world and once we fully grasp that nothing will ever be the same again. And then in the introduction, you also have a quote though at the foreword that says, I see you, you are important to me and I value you, which is an African greeting, uh, Saobuna. So let's start by you telling us, first of all, why did you write this book on quantum social change? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, it's a great question because um, I'm a human geographer and I've been studying climate change for decades and I've been very concerned about the implications of climate change for um, humans and biodiversity and just um, wondering, you know, you know, what do we do about it? How do we actually move the needles on the curves for um, climate change? And I about 12 years ago, I, um, I came across um, some work that um, social scientists were doing on quantum social science, and I thought it was really fascinating. And I also was looking at, um, you know, books in um, physics of like that about quantum physics and that reality is not what it seems. So the question I had for myself was, you know, what if social reality is not what it seems? And what if we are underestimating our collective capacity for social change to respond to global issues like climate change and biodiversity loss? Mm. You know, so so when I was reading the book, one of the things that struck me also was the ability to weave in quantum mechanics into social mechanics, if you would have used that phrase. And, and so I think let's just start by, first of all, maybe just talking about what you see as the difference in terms of classical Newtonian review of the world, which is, I guess, based on individualist, individualism and some of the sort of conventional things that we know, and some of the quantum physics or quantum mechanic concepts. Well, what do you see the difference and why you think it's important mm -hmm. that we start having a whole new view of the world from a quantum perspective? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that, you know, paradigms are very powerful because they are like the thought patterns and um, beliefs, you know, how we make sense of the world, the world. And um, from a classical perspective, it's, you know, we're, it's, it is very individualistic, atomistic, reductionist, and subjects and objects are very separate. And more than 100 years ago, scientists looking at the subatomic level started to realize like, whoa, electrons and photons behave very differently. So they were introducing concepts such as indeterminacy, um, complementarity, superpositions, coherence, entanglement, et cetera, that was really starting to change the way we relate to the objective world um, without us. So Niels Bohr is, you know, was emphasizing from the Copenhagen interpretation of climate change that we are part of the nature that we are looking at. So it's, it, it really gives us a different perspective, a both and perspective on, you know, particles and waves, you know, can both exist at the same time. And it's, you know, it's truly mind blowing. And I think, you know, there's so many different different interpretations of quantum physics, but, you know, coming back to the social world, why do we just assume that we are these classical deterministic, you know, um, individuals who cannot come together collectively and collaborate in a, you know, in a coherent way? Mm. Yeah, you know, again, if if one is not uh, deeply entrenched in, in, in quantum mechanics and quantum physics, you may be scared from reading the book, but I can tell you, uh, you know, someone who studied it myself, to some extent in college, I had to go back and, and revisit some of those concepts to really enjoy the book. And, and so I, I think just to give the audience a little bit of a, an understanding, a lot of terminologies in the book that I think people need to understand, but we're not gonna go through all of them. I think a few of them that I think are very important for the context of discussing climate change, just get your views on them. One is the notion of entanglement, which I think is so intriguing about from the individualistic standpoint, we're actually entangled. So talk a little bit about entanglement. And then, and then perhaps you can talk about the notion of uh, non-locality, uh, what, what that means, uh, and explain it sort of from a social, social uh, science perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think like non-locality and entanglement are very much connected because entanglement in our everyday classical language it means entwined or, you know, like twisted together. But in quantum entanglement, it is a non-local phenomena where information about um, separated particles, um, you know, part of the same system is revealed when a measurement is made on one of them. So without any kind of, you know, um, causality, you know, direct causal interactions. And so Einstein referred to it as spooky action at a a distance, but there really is no action. It's just information being revealed and um, and showing that, you know, you measure something here and it actually, you know, you know, you have information about something there. So that non-locality is, you know, that in a social perspective, it's, you know, when we look at, you know, what we do and everything, we want to see causal results. I influenced Lawrence, I did this, but in a non-local sense, when we're entangled through language, through meaning, through values, it's, um, it's we can have influences on a much wider um, um, scale without actually influencing, you know, um, directly sending information to people, but the, but it's really like in a collective field, when I do something that benefits the climate system, it is actually influencing others around the world and others are um, taking actions equally. You know, it's mm-hmm. kind of changing the, the, the whole social discourse on how we are in the world. Two, two other concepts I think is are worth talking about a little bit is the notion of potentiality. And, and also the idea of uncertainty. Talk a little bit about those two ideas or those two mm-hmm. concepts. Yeah, well, in quantum physics, you know, we, we talk about uncertainty, like what we don't know about the future. But in, in quantum physics, many interpretations take uncertainty as the very nature of the world that we uh, a, a, a wave of possibility and potentiality exists until we collapse it into a material reality and material, you know, something that is measurable. And I think that that's something that is 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 super interesting, because, you know, if we, we are a wave of potential until we make a measurement, until we observe it. And, and that's been, I think, the, if, you know, the dual um, slit experiment that was carried out in the last century, you know, showing that, that um, photons and electrons and subatomic particles could be either waves or particles, depending on whether the, um, the, uh, it was measured, a measurement is made. And so that idea of potentiality that is, I think, is super important for when we're talking about climate change, because we talk, you know, we say like, oh, no, we'll never make the 1.5 
degrees Celsius target or the two degrees Celsius target. But if we look at it in terms of potentiality and possibilities and things, there are actually, there is a window of opportunity for us to make that change. And how will we collapse reality? What can I do right here and right now to actually influence that? So, so there's a lot of metaphors here and a lot of, you know, like similarities in meanings. And there's also a lot of, um, just methodological things that are being brought into social sciences from quantum physics. And I think entanglement, nobody really understands it, but it actually is, um, has profound implications that not just at the subatomic scale, but they're finding that even, you know, small protons are entangled. Hmm. Interesting. So, so in the book, you, you talk about mattering and you talk about, you know, the, the whole title of the book is you matter more than you think. So, you, you, but then in the book, you talk about 10 different things that matter before you get to actually you being mattered or you mattering as a person. Let's talk about a few of them. Uh, you talk about paradigms uh, mattering. You talk about the decade and you talk about beliefs. So let's basically walk through each of these and maybe take mm -hmm. you know, one or two minutes and just try to help the audience to understand you know, these different things. Let's start with the decade. Why does this decade matter? Mm -hmm. Well, this decade matters because we really have a very limited window of opportunity to make dramatic changes um, in our um, energy systems, transport systems, food systems, water systems to avoid dangerous tipping points in the Earth system. And um, if people say like, oh, the decade that matters, you know, it's, it's, it's we have more, you know, we're looking, long, this is a long term issue. Um, but and I think, you know, the decade that we're always in the decade that matter. But science itself is telling us right now that um, that it actually is essential and urgent that we respond, um, not just with more of the same, but respond in a very different way. And so that space of urgency, I think, open has it in it. it it invites us to open our minds to thinking about mattering in a very different way. And by mattering, I mean, not just being significant, but also being of substance, you know, and that's where in the physical thing, it's, it's, it's about mattering in the physical sense, but also in the um, in sense of significance. Mm -hmm. And if there's ever a decade when we have to really challenge ourselves and our thinking and our ways of doing, it's now. So the decade matters because of the urgency for action. And we get back mm -hmm. into agency. But for that to happen, there needs to be some shifts, right? And so you talk about paradigm shifts and how paradigms matter. And I, and I said something a couple of weeks ago to myself as I was thinking through another issue. And I said, you know, what needs to change to affect climate change, if you were to use the phrase climate change? But if we were to use the phrase tipping points, uh, what paradigms, why do paradigms matter? Mm -hmm. Well, paradigms are, you know, our thought patterns or the way that we really um, conceive of the, um, you know, of the world. And so our paradigms, they influence the where, where we draw the lines around systems, how we see ourselves related to the systems, what we value, what we're, you know, what they're, they're so essential. And an influential paper on leverage points on places to intervene in systems really points to paradigms as one of the most um, powerful leverage points for systems change. And the most powerful lever leverage point is the capacity to transcend paradigms and just look at paradigms rather than take, you know, being within a paradigm. But um, for me, you know, with an interest in transformations to sustainability, I'm very, you know, I thought we should be working with the highest leverage points possible now, given that um, the, you know, the scope, the, sc the scale, the speed and the depth that we have to transform at. So for me, paradigms are really like what, you know, how are we, what is the lens that I'm looking at the world through? And um, the classical paradigm still is very dominant in both science and in society. And we see that today in polarization. We see that in fragmentation. We see that in othering and our, in a, you know, the quote that you mentioned in the beginning of just, you know, being able to see ourselves in others has really, um, you know, it's, it's increasingly disappeared. So how do we, you know, how do we shift the way that we're looking at the world so that we can, you know, start to see that and realize that potential for transformative change? Okay, so the decade matter. Paradigms are critical because it affects our thinking. And you also then talk about beliefs mattering and well, as well as metaphors. So let's talk about beliefs. Talk mm -hmm. about why beliefs matter in the context of quantum social change. Yeah, yeah. I can talk about that both in the context of 
quantum social change and climate change. In terms of climate change, you know, we have a lot of these, I don't believe in climate change, or I do believe in that, that has a really big influence, you know, how, how are we understanding our role in the universe, our role in the earth system, you know, the fact that, you know, we as individuals are actually influencing climate systems and hydrological systems, etc. So that kind of, you know, there's a, there's some power there, and it's not about just do I believe in climate change? Is how do I understand that relationship and what paradigm am I coming from? And also powerful is like, I don't believe I matter. You know, if you just, if we really don't think that we are capable of transforming, it's important. And so one of the interpretations of um, quantum physics that I find very interesting is called quantum Bayesianism or cubism. And that really is, um, it's recognizing that a quantum state is the degree of subjective beliefs about possible outcomes that an individual holds. So it's really like our bets on the future. And quantum Bayesianism is interesting because it really, it puts the scientist back into, um, you know, the, the subject back into science. So saying that we actually, our beliefs, our collective beliefs matter and that we can update those beliefs all the time and then we're gonna get a different outcome. So if we're betting that we will not meet the, um, the Paris Agreement, for example, then we're probably going to start doing things that, um, you know, to, to adapt to a three degree world or a four degree world or things like that. But if we start to bet that we actually can do it, we're going to make investments in renewable energies, we're going to be taking care of vulnerable people, etc. So, so to me, the beliefs, you know, and it's not about just um, um, seeing the world through our beliefs, but it's really being able to look at our beliefs and being able to, um, you know, challenge them when necessary. So if we talk the concept of non-locality and you've talked about beliefs and paradigms and, and I want to then talk about non-locality in the context of language, uh, because in the book, you also talk about the importance of language, how you can sort of a uh, language is one, one of the medium of us as quantum uh, creatures uh, coexisting, the entanglement, the, the superposition of, the, the, of us as, as beings through language and other, other means. So let's talk about language in the context of the ongoing discussion that will take place in, in, the, in, the, in Sham El Sheikh at, at COP. How important is it for us to get the language right as we talk about the change that needs to happen? Whether you call it X or Y can make a difference. So how important is language when we talk about making the kinds of changes that are necessary to address the challenges we face? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's super it's essential. And, you know, anyone who's negotiated um, for international agreements on climate change knows that the language, you know, you can spend a lot of time just discussing one or two words. And even in the you know, intergovernmental panel on climate change assessments, when you are in plenary approval sessions with governments, every word matters. And, and I think it's, though, you know, to how do we, you know, we need language that connects with people from different worldviews, from different backgrounds, from different contexts. And that's where, you know, the, the dimensions of, um, of language becomes, uh, you know, like essential, not just, you know, how we're speaking, but how we're listening to each other too. And often people go into um, a, um, a, a negotiation or a discussion and everything and have everything kind of already um, set out in their heads. They're not necessarily listening to the other side and hearing other perspectives and connecting deeply with, you know, what what's of value to um, to all of us and seeing things, you know, from a, a large scale system. So we end up more in you know, like a food fight for, you know, my my, you know, us or other and right or wrong. And everything then really trying to come to that um, that common concern. And if there's anything, you know, that climate change is showing us is that we have some very common concerns and that, you know, the whole ideas of winners and losers and things really falls apart when we're talking about um, the, the scale and the scope of changes that are, are underway. So I want to go back to the, the quote at the beginning of the book that says uh, the African greeting, I see you, you are important to me and I value you. Because another thing you talk about in terms of mattering is relationships. You say relationships mm -hmm. matter. Um, we're going to Glasgow, I mean, sorry, to uh, Egypt. COP is going to be this, uh, taking place next week. And there's a lot of discussions about what's happening in terms of equity, uh, you know, uh, the just transition, uh, environmental justice. All of these concepts speak to this idea of I value you, you matter, you're important to me. Talk about relationship in the context of 
of uh, quantum social change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think really relationships matter because really, if we look at it, climate change, biodiversity loss, all of these are really relationship problems. If we, you know, to, if you really draw it down, it's like, where do I draw the line between, you know, me and you and us and other and humans and nature, et cetera. And, you know, who is in my circle of care and how wide can that be? Does it include people on small island states? Does it include future generations? And so when we start to think about, you know, like the, the biggest we possible, we start to come up with like different ideas of what is a good solution or not a good solution. And so the equity dimension, that's a value that applies to everybody. You have to say, you know, you can't say equity is important for you, but not for me so it's it is you know very universal in that sense and so is like dignity justice fairness all of those things and so you know when in um in the cop meetings they'll be talking about loss and damages and compensation and and there's a lot of really you know things that we we have to start addressing um with climate change but we have to recognize too that you know just how important it is to take actions now that will benefit the whole will benefit future generations you know to be that good ancestor as um, you've talked about last week on the um, on the last conversation, and it's just you know there it's essential then that we find a language that can really um, convey those relationships. And unfortunately, English doesn't necessarily have the language to really show that I and we are related, that the individual and the collective is the same, that I am the system. You know, it's it is very um, like divided into subjects and objects and nouns and verbs and. It's interesting uh, when you talk about English doesn't have, have a, does not have the language I'm thinking of the word. I'm thinking about, you know, you mentioned polarization across the world today. Uh, this idea of, you know, the individualistic approach. Um, how, how does one come up with a word that captures the idea of our entanglement, of our interdependentness, uh, or the fact that what I do locally has has an impact globally. What mm. what what's the process to sort of a recreate a new way of communicating, both from a political standpoint, from a business standpoint? How do we change the language that we mm -hmm. use, the language that governs the world? How do we get from a deterministic uh, Newtonian worldview, if you may, to a more uh, quantum worldview and have the quantum lexicon? I would call it. How do we do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the quantum lex the lexicon is really important because, you know, as I mentioned, English doesn't necessarily have the right words, so we may have to borrow them from um, other languages, um, indigenous um, languages and, and, and ways, um, languages that represent other ways of seeing the world. And, you know, we're always borrowing words from other languages, loan words. And it's it's essential then that we start to really think about, you know, what is being aware of what's included and what's not included in our language. And um, yeah, so I think that the the borrowing from languages that exist already and that represent this. But um, but in other ways, we just have to, we can make up words. Like um, I just bracketed I and we because, you know, just to say like, yes, we need to make up that wor world word. But um, psychologist and psychiatrist Daniel Siegel puts together me and we as we. And so, you know, if we can talk about we, you know, and we're talking you know, a lot about different pronouns and language, but if we can say, I'm, you know, instead of saying you and I, it's, it's we, <laughs> um, me and you. So. Yeah, what, what have been the, re the, the response? Because what you're trying to do in the book is you're talking about a kind of what I call it uh, paradigm shift in terms of how we even educate ourselves about the world, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And so most of the structures we have in place today, uh, like you said, are based on, you know, Newtonian way of thinking. Now you're trying to disrupt the system and bring a whole different approach to thinking. And so if we start to talk about the title of the book, You Matter More Than You Think, let's talk about you mattering. What does that mean? And, and, and how can you sort of in a concise way, get the audience, the listeners, the viewers to understand what that actually means. You matter. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I think that it, there's, it has almost a double meaning. You, you matter, meaning you are significant, but you are actually, you matter more than you think. It's not just what you think, it's who you are, how you show up, and that it, you're mattering in every moment. You know, we are collapsing a wave of potential into a concrete action by, you know, whether we choose to walk or drive, whether we choose to eat this or that, whether we choose to vote this or that. You know, we are, we are constantly mattering and having implications and you know, non-local implications around, um, you know, around the world and across time. And I think that's such an important thing is that every single person matters. And just to be able to bring that, um, you know, that, that recognition that I'm not just this trivial individual, but I'm part of something much larger. And to me that, you know, it has implications, not just like for theory, but in practice. And, um, and that brings us then to, you know, like, how do we transform, you know, in the practical sphere and the political sphere and in the personal sphere and see those as all one but one of the one of the you know the barriers to those kinds of transformation and paradigm shifts are the established structures right and so you, you mm -hmm. talk about in the book that you have the hierarchical structures and and their winners and losers and those who have the power do want to give up the power so when you talk about just some of these simple changes as talking about we you know, as opposed to I mm -hmm. can create a whole different value system because now you're not valuing just yourself so how do we break down some of the barriers towards moving from a more deterministic sort of I, I world to a more sort of a quantum entangled world where I know my actions have implications for others? Mm -hmm. How do we do that? Yeah, yeah. The how is a really important question because it's like you know, it's like it's very easy to say, oh, one quantum world, you know, we're all entangled, etc. But then you kind of go, you know, we we meet people and it's like, who are you? You're the, you know, you, we other people very quickly, rather than seeing, okay, what's what what matters to this person? How what are their values? What are their fears? What are they? You know, what what is driving this? And you know, it, you're absolutely right. We need to disrupt. Um, systems that are unsustainable, inequitable, you know, how do we, how do we shift those conversations so that we actually can open the spaces and allow those to come and, you know, going into those questions, it's not like thing, things aren't the way they are, just, you know, randomly, you know, we're there, we're, there's a whole, you know, globalization, there's um, arms trades, there's, you know, food trade, there's, there's a lot of things that are, are supporting inequitable and, um, and oppressive, um, things that are really damaging the environment and other species. So it's not just that it's this, you know, we can just point fingers to blame. It's we have to really look at that um, from a systems perspective and look very critically at it and then think, how can I engage differently? Not necessarily doing different things, but showing up differently. And, and that's the, you know, it's as much as an art as a science of transforming. And, and to me, I think it goes, again, away from you matter more than you think, like just in your heads, but in your heart. How do I connect deeply with um, people that, you know, don't share my worldview, don't necessarily care about these things, and yet they care about something. And then, and how do we find the people who really do care and, and really, you know, move, move action so that we do, um, like, move things forward and get results? Yeah, and so to tell the audience, if you have questions, please uh, put it in the chat box. I'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, let's just stay on the subject of transforming uh, in sort of a making the idea of you mattering. And let's talk about the transformation sphere, the three spheres of transformation in, in, in the book. It was in your previous book, but you also bring it up in this book in which you talk about the practical sphere, political sphere, the personal sphere. Talk a little bit about, as we think of transforming systems with regards to dealing with the tipping points around climate and global systems, how do those three spheres interact? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the three spheres are really like an abstraction. And we, you know, we we look at like the practical stuff and most of our attention um, goes to practical things. You know, we want to see um, more renewable energy. We want to see, um, you know, um, plant-based diets and people on bicycles and all these things. And a lot of the like the sustainable development goals are focused on that very practical sphere. But as we know, the political sphere, sphere really matters. It's how we organize society and the systems, the structures, you know, the norms, the rules, the um, the institutions that are, are influencing what outcomes we have in the practical sphere. So those are always interacting and um, they're, you know, they're, you can't separate them. Practical changes can influence 
influence the um, changes in the political sphere, you know, for example, through um, cell phones, etc. But it's the personal sphere that is often just kind of, you know, set aside and not necessarily taken seriously. And the quantum paradigm tells us that no, that subjectivity, those our beliefs, our values, our worldviews, the whole paradigm through which we're looking at ourselves and our systems is, is actually influential on the results that we see. And so, um, you know, often when we're talking about um, the personal sphere, and by personal, I mean individual and collective, because we are not separate. Um, often we're just, um, thinking that like, oh, I, we need to change people's beliefs, values, and worldviews. And there's a lot of that talk right now. And, you know, there's a lot of finger pointing and saying, you know, you need to be green, you need to be, you know, um, this or that. And what we do then is turn people into the, like, like objects to be changed rather than the subjects of change in their own life. And so, you know, mattering and giving people that sense of agency, not just individual agency, but collective agency and political agency. And to see that, you know, agency that, you know, all species have, you know, that agency agency isn't just a um you know a human attribute and so how do we work together as a whole for this and um and i think that's the um you know like the essence of you matter more than you think yeah you know um and i'm going to get into some of the questions in the book because you did something fascinating that not many authors have done that i'm aware of and i will mm -hmm. say that i will say that for the audience i will, I will bring the surprise mm -hmm. shortly but before i do that i want to come back to this idea of sort of approaches to dealing with things like polarization. There is an example in the book where you, something called alternative UK, where, where in the context of fractals, right, where you want to have ripple effects of different actions, they did something where they're trying to sort of a look at politics, but then look at change by looking at the values. And they've introduced values like courage, generosity, transparency, humility, humor, empathy. Do you think one of the ways to tackle the issue of polarization or tackle other challenges and global issues we're facing is to bring some of these new values into the conversation? And if so, how do we best do it? Yeah, that's a great question because it is, um, and I've been very inspired by the Alternative UK because they really are working to overcome polarization through community action networks, um, etc. And it's not just in terms of like just bringing new values into the conversations, but really is standing in those values from what we do, you know, so when we are, you know, um, compassionate or having humility, we actually listen to others differently. And often today, people are just talking right past each other and a lot a lot of the efforts, for example, at climate activism are really going against, you know, very disruptive, how do we go against, but it's not trying to find those um, comments. And it's not to say that, you know, we don't need, you know, the, the disruptions of those things, but how can we find that place? And the, the Alternative UK is um, is really working to at this like cosmo local vision that, that we can, that every, you know, to, to really bring people together in small communities. And when we start to look at, you know, how to scale change, it is often in smaller communities that, that the real actions are going to happen. So that, and they, they scale up fractally by creating, you know, recursive patterns that are based on values that apply to all. So it's, it's when you start to like limit it to values that, oh, this is only good for say Norway or me or something that you create the fragments and the polarization. Mm. Yeah, it's almost like, you know, that transformational change very seldom would occur at the extremes, if you may. There has mm -hmm. to be some something in the middle that would bring about change. Uh, and so in that context, I guess, uh, whether you're on one side or the other, polarization doesn't really, or extremes really don't bring about the transformational change you're talking about. It's sort of a coming together, bringing the extremes closer together around mm -hmm. some unifying theme. Now, let's 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 take one question from the audience before I, I get into a few questions in the book. So there's a question here from Tim Q who's asking, very interesting question. So other species are social as well. And how do they, uh, how are they expected to adapt or change? Uh, and he makes sort of, a, sort of a side note, nature often surprises us. And I guess in the context of, 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 um, of uh, you know, the, the discussion around uh, dealing with the issue of, you know, uh, uh, whether it's fractals or this idea around, you know, quantum change, can you talk a little bit about nature? Because it's not just us in the world, right? So mm -hmm. often yeah. we think it's just us. So talk a little bit about just this idea mm -hmm. of change and adaptation. 
Uh, yeah. That's a great question because, you know, it's like if we see nature as something separate and, you know, like and other species as something to be managed or a resource for us, rather than seeing ourselves as nature and that we are related um, to nature. And as we, you know, it, it brings in the questions of, um, you know, how are how our species responding to what we're doing um, if we are um, you know, sometimes the solutions to climate change, for example, will have very negative implications for biodiversity. And we saw during COVID that, you know, when we released those pressures that um, nature responded in very different, you know, kept coming out and there was more of a, um, you know, in urban areas of, of nature. And so taking that pressure off is essential. But from that quantum perspective, it really is at the heart of it is that, you know, we are nature, we are entangled. And, um, I work, I cite a lot of Karen Barad's work on agential realism, and she recognizes that, you know, agency is, you know, like that we're, we're just kind of congealing our agency, you know, into a reality, and that it's non-human agency as well. So how, you know, are the way that we take care of ourselves and other species is, um, is really essential to the thriving of the world. And if we don't get that, you know, if we don't get that, that the, the well-being of insects, the well-being of, of oceans, the well-being of, um, of soils are essential for our own well-being, and if we still see them as separate from us, then, um, you know, yeah, we, we, there's good signs, but we know where we're going. <laughs> Yeah. So, so Karen, the book is fascinating. Uh, again, let me, before I get into it, I should again, congratulate you because you did something that was very interesting. You actually took the, uh, the first draft of the book, you put it on the internet. It was downloaded by, I guess, 100, 800 people. Mm -hmm. And, and you got a lot of questions. You got a lot of criticism. You got a lot of skeptics. And so I want to just walk through a few questions from some of your skeptics and have you respond to them. Mm -hmm. uh, because I'm sure as we're having this conversation right now, there might still be skeptics. I must say that even when I was reading the book first, I started off a little skeptical. Can you really apply quantum physics to social science? Mm -hmm. And I was convinced towards the end of the book, that yes, you can. So here is one question here. Um, so basically, your argument about think changing thinking and changing practice is rather ahistorical and ageographical. And so what about the real variable constraints many people face in thinking and acting in places such as Russia, Brazil, Myanmar? And so I'm guessing here in terms of, can you really apply quantum social change in those sort of environment? What are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, um, I th that was a really important question for me as a geographer, because it's not like just that quantum social change is something for elites and privileged, but it really recognizes that everyone matters and everyone has that capacity to move systems and structures, uh, you know, like, but of course there are different constraints around it, but it also then brings that responsibility for um you know, to to all of us for exactly the, you know, the trade flows, the weapons flows, everything that is is keeping things down, we can see in global politics how, um, how influence, you know, the, the language of, um, you know, over the last polarized language spreads across countries and it influences politics. So how does, how do you get so that people, every single person can, um, can influence those systems? And that's what we, we're seeing throughout history is that it, those changes have always started from small groups of individuals working collectively. And for example, in Myanmar, the young people there are so committed to democracy and to an ethical and e equitable um, um, way forward. And, you know, they say like, you know, you've messed with the wrong generation. And so having that capacity, recognizing that radical relationality and that potentiality. And, you know, I, I refer a lot to Paulo Freire because um, I think his pedagogy of the oppressed was really important of just saying how we, we tend to just normalize things. And from a, you know, hierarchical perspective, or this is just the way things are, you know, these people have no power. And, and I think that that's something that we really do need to challenge and question and support that every single person does have that capacity and how do we build them and it goes back to how are we educating um, future generations how are we educating ourselves for for this because most of us have been really brought up in a very um you know that this is you know a socialized mindset that this is the way things are and don't you know and if, when you push against cultural and social norms you often get a lot of pushback yeah. and so um you know we can't expect people to be cheering when you're disrupting systems 
it gets into the point about the potentiality not being unleashed because systems put pressure on individuals that don't allow them to, to, to you know, let the potential be brought to bear. Uh, so, so here is an interesting question that would, you were asked and I want you to talk about. Uh, there are those who might be hearing this, just like those who read the first draft of the book, who said, you know, Karen, this seems all utopian, you know, this is not real, this is just, I don't know, nice talk, but really, I mean, can it really happen? And so the question is, is the lack of sustained examples proof positive that the arguments you lay out in the book are more idealistic or utopian? What would you say to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that the proof positive is that the old paradigm is not working very well for us on this planet right now. And so that's where I think that, you know, we don't have, but except that we do, you know, the, and I mentioned this in the book of, you know, the quantum social change isn't something that is just new. It's been discussed in indigenous knowledge systems and wisdom traditions and the social sciences and humanities um, have been pointing to this a lot, you know, for forever to just say that, yes, subjectivity matters. How are we, you know, how we relate matters, the stories we tell matter, um, all of this. And so, so for me, it's, um, it's the, the proof really is, is that we are in a situation that is completely unsustainable and that it's really worth um, asking different questions and linking to different ways of seeing the the world, different cosmovisions, different worldviews, and um, and that's you know we it's we're, we often focus on what's wrong in the world, but we could also look at what's right because many people are actually practicing this and living this. And as you know, we have the quotes in the book of there's many people who are relational in their inherent ways of being, and so it's it's really that um, uh, uh, we've been so challenged in the last hundred years of with this very the, you know, the great acceleration towards a, a world of um, that is highly unsustainable. So for me, that um, the proof really needs to be, you know, we got to go like, how to, could you prove that that this um, classical worldview that is influencing social science and economics, et cetera, is actually sustainable? It reminds me of one worldview that was changed over time was that the world was supposed to be you know, the Copernicus whole story and how mm -hmm. the reaction to what he said about the world was received and how it was acted upon. So there will always be skeptics to these sort of a big transformational uh, paradigm shift, which brings me to the next question you got when you put the book online mm -hmm. and you got uh, feedback. And I think this is interesting. Paradigms take a long time to change and we do not have time, given the fact that we start out by talking about the issue of the decade matters, right? So the urgency. Mm -hmm. So given the urgency, shouldn't we just focus on political solutions and social movements? Why should we worry about this idea of quantum social change and changing the narratives and all of that? What would you say to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I get that a lot that oh, we don't have time for that. And I think that's very dangerous because you would might, you know, the logical the solution might be like geoengineering the atmosphere or, or doing things that aren't um, sustainable and equitable in the long run. And, you know, back in 1962, when Thomas Kuhn wrote his book on the structure of scientific revolutions, you know, it was very much about waiting for people to die before paradigms change. But we're living in a world where worldviews are changing. We're living long enough to actually reflect on our own worldview and we're living through multiple crises so that we you know we have that capacity to start to challenge like okay why do I think this way what you know and we also have the internet and we have conversations like this and we have different ways of communicating with each other that didn't exist before so the paradigm shift that um that we're talking about has been going on forever <laughs> you know it's like and now it's it's you know it's can we gain momentum rapidly enough to shift the material world so that we're not um overheating the planet and destroying um ecosystems and biodiversity so it's it is a you know that it's not about just going out there and changing the paradigm, but it's actually occupying the paradigm and living it today. And that's one of the important points in the book is that, you know, we can't just keep pushing off the, you know, till 2030 or 2040 or 2050, these ideas of, um, you know, energy transitions, et cetera. We actually have to like bring that to the present. And um, and that's where in the, in the first draft, I had a chapter called Time Matters, because mm -hmm. I think that also quantum physics tells us a lot about, you know, past, present, present and future. And, um, it was just too challenging for me to <laughs> include in the book. So like this decade matters was the. the... So, you know, I, I, as you were speaking, you know, I have young, young kids, you know, and, and, you know, they're doing science and, and they're, you know, studying over the world. And I'm just intrigued. At what point do we start teaching quantum physics? 
to kids because if the educational system we have today, which sort of underpins where we end up in the next 50 years, continues to be grounded in you know, Newtonian physics, uh, saying that it's the only way, because uh, I don't think you're suggesting that we should do away with classical physics or classical mechanics, right? Basically, uh, we need to sort of uh, bring the two together. So when do we start seeing quantum concepts popping up in educational curriculum? When should that start yeah. happening or is it already happening? Mm, it's, it's a really important question. I know there's a book, Quantum Physics for Babies, but it's not necessarily about bringing it into the social world. And, you know, a pioneer in quantum social science and quantum social theory, Alexander Wendt, that's one of his largest concerns is why are we still teaching the methods and the meaning, you know, how, why are we still teaching a classical social science when we could be teaching quantum decision making, quantum game theory, quantum finance, and all of these fields that are actually existing. It's just a little bit off the radar. And so, you know, I think it's it's um, it's critical to start to think about how we bring that in in a skillful way, because it's, um, you know, just to open people's minds to it. I think it could be, be um, you know, just even the, the concepts of potentiality. And and for that, I think your quantum lexicon could be really useful. You know, this idea that we need the language to introduce in schools and um, and it maybe it would be also that younger um children will get it very easily, you know, like both end, yes. <laughs> so, so let me, let me, let me just ask you then, Karen, you, you're at the university, University of Oslo. Uh, do you see the role of uh, university courses sort of uh, interspersing some ideas around quantum mechanics, quantum physics, quantum social change? I mean, at the university where you are, uh, do you see quantum social change or quantum mechanics finding its way into other faculty? Um, not yet. <laughs> I, I introduce it in my class on transformations to sustainability, and um, that will be when we talk about deeper transformations and different, you know, how different ways of understanding the world influence how we um, act in that world. So, so that will be my Monday lecture. Um, but I do get, um, I get invited to a lot of um, talks at other universities because people are very, you know, like, open to thinking about like, okay, what does that mean? And especially people working on socioecological um, systems change and that are are just you know really struggling with what do we do now how do we make a difference how do we have an impact how do we link what's what we know from science with what we do in society and rather than keeping those as separate and so to me the um, I see especially among younger um, like PhD students, postdocs, they're very open to it. And I think for many students, it's just they haven't ever considered it before. So how do we bring that in? And one way is by also introducing, you know, like different ways of knowing, including from indigenous knowledge, traditions and and art and science and the humanities. And there's 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 so many ways that we can bring in more transdisciplinary learning for students that opens up the solution space away from just thinking of us as you know our carbon footprints, but thinks about how do we tell different stories, how do we use music, how do we embody these changes and how do we recognize that we matter collectively. Well we started this conversation talking about you know, the road to uh, COP27. And one of the things we at Influential Minds here at EI, one of the things we like to do is to really sort of bring diverse voices to the conversation. Uh, obviously, electricity is critical uh, for, for the world. The energy sector is, is important and in the electricity sector and in the US and other parts of the world, they're all doing, you know, their part to sort of tackle this issue. But now I'm going to put you at COP. Uh, uh, like I did with some of my previous guests, mm -hmm. and and talk about quantum social change. You have a, a minute or so to sort of a, mm -hmm. you know make the case for the decision makers. We'll first start with uh, four categories of, of, of actors at COP27. We'll begin with the uh, uh, the policymakers, politicians. Uh, mm -hmm. They're there. You're with them. How would you advocate for them at least beginning to apply? some of the ideas around quantum social change as they think about solutions mm -hmm. to deal with the climate crisis? What would you say? Yeah, I would start by asking questions because inquiries open minds rather than, you know, shut them down if I tell them what to do. But I'd say like, you know, what matters to you? What's important to you and for others, for future generations, for your children, for people, you know, all over, all over the world. And, um, and I would just, 
you know, ask them to, to really think about what they can do differently, you know, <laughs> like not different things, but how can they do things differently? And it might mean like listening deeply to um, the other negotiators. It might mean looking for those solutions that exist right here and now that are often like just not, you know, that could be right in front of our face, but we're not necessarily seeing or listening um, you know, um, to them, they're they're not part of that um, the mainstream script. So, so I would you know just let the pol get the policymakers to inquire about their own reason for being there, because I think many you know all of them who are committed to climate change action, they 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 have a deep value. And how do we connect those values with um, with others in a in a constructive rather than a polarizing way? Okay, so we move from having the conversation with the policymakers because I was looking at your political sphere. We got the three spheres, so we dealt with the political sphere. But in that sphere of politics, let's just branch over to business. Now, the role of business is very critical, and a lot of businesses are doing a lot uh, to, you know, to, to help make a difference here. How do they apply sort of a quantum social change, even in terms of their business models? I mean, do you see this? Uh, some of these concepts finding room in as they develop business solutions to deal with some of the challenges we face. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, just even the concept of global value chains, you know, we talk about that as like value added from an economic sense, but we could talk about global value chains, you know, how, you know, those are alive and with meaning. And so how do we care about the coffee producers or the, you know, the people who are making the chips or whatever, um, whatever we're needing and, and really to take in to account not just the those producers but also the environment around them and the the you know the the potential for having businesses that are sustainable over you know the next 100 200 400 years and some businesses maybe are not some some products and services and things are not sustainable and they have to be rethought but that's where imagination comes in and businesses are very good at creative thinking and innovation and you know we have a whole movement towards a regenerative economy and regenerative agriculture and businesses are coming in and seeing that it's essential and and they can you know they have an enormous power to move the needle but they also you know have to then confront some of the things where they fragment where they polarize where they are um, are creating, um, you know, destroying um, nature or um, or the climate um, okay. in there. So many possibilities. Okay. Well, that's that's good. So we've got the policy, the policymakers, and, 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 and sort of the politicians and others. And then we've talked talk, talked about the businesses. You also have a lot of environmental groups, activists, and other groups at there at at the, at the COP. Uh, what's your message to them in terms of how they go about engaging, right? And how they go about uh, talking about this? How do we get away from, from the extremes in terms of, you know, either or and get into more both and concept? What would be your message to them in terms of uh, what they should do while at the COP? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that I think is, again, very similar to the same. It's like, what is, you know, like really remembering what they're there for. And many are driven by equity. Many are driven by social justice and caring for the, pla the planet and, you know, feeling a real grief that nature is being destroyed. And, and I would think about, you know, how, again, you know, how can you use tools, you know, that from the look at the practical, the political and the personal together and look for tools to design conversations differently, to design systems differently, to shift things in a different way through conversations with others rather than polarizing conversations and you know we certainly like we see a lot of you know like more um activism that is kind of to, to draw attention to but how do you shift minds and hearts and and i think that that's a, it's a skill and to me i think like a you matter movement among activists would be able to take all that powerful energy and really push it into, you know, the, those, you know, having that leverage to, um, to shift systems and cultures for results. So, um, yes. so I get very inspired by the energy in, in Yes. That. Well, let's end on the note of, uh, there's a lot of skepticisms around, you know, the future of the world. In fact, one of the questions here was, given the situation the world is in today, uh, is there any hope for transformative change? And so, what would be your take on that and maybe extend that question to include the next generation, the younger generation? How do we get them to become part of this sort of a quantum social change world as opposed to the world we had before? What would yeah. be your 
thoughts on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. On the, on the one hand, you know, we're always, we're all part of it already. So it's like, and that's where we didn't talk about consciousness, but to be actually aware that we are, you know, that we matter, that other people matter and, and that, um, you know, it's not about just having hope, but it's about action and agency. It's about showing up and not just how, you know, just, you know, showing up, but it's the quality of agency. It's the, um, you know, it's exactly like you're being, you're doing, you're thinking and everything. And I think that if, you know, it gives us so much more potential for radical social change, getting to the root causes of these things, which are the relationship problems. So, you know, where do I draw the line between us and others? How do I take care of the entire world? And and to that, you know, you can you just getting people in their mind to just not just going like I matter, but to say you matter and the tree matters and forests matter and 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 future generations matter. And to me, that's um, you know what drives me in in this is you know thinking, you know, a hundred years from now, what will people look back and what will they say like, wow, what were they thinking? They couldn't see clearly that they were entangled, that they mattered, that they could have done something in 2022, you know, being in, you know, the, the COP27, that they had so much potential to make, to, to reduce, um, you know, all the risks and vulnerabilities. And so, and that's where I feel that, you know, that we really need to open our minds rather than close them. And to me, quantum social science is a really, you know, um, provocative and enticing way to get us to think differently and to open our minds to many, you know, the the many solutions that are already out there. And many people are talking about them in other, with other languages. And, you know, maybe, you know, as, as a social scientist, it's like, you know, paying attention to um, to that um, the potential of us as humans in relation um, as nature. Well, you know, as an as an engineer, uh, uh, you know, one's deeply involved in a lot of scientific research from an energy system perspective. It's been fascinating digging myself into this quantum social mm-hmm. change world. Uh, the book is fascinating. Uh, you matter more than you think, uh, and I think it's important for us to end. On the positive note here with this African greeting that you have in the book where you say, I see you, you are important to me, and I value you. And I think we can all sort of embrace that mindset. Um, it would be great. So, you know, Professor O'Brien, thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations again on the book. Uh, and, 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 uh, and I wish you all the best. And I will take your offer on working on this uh, quantum social lexicon uh, and okay. see how we can advance things. So thank you so much and, and, and hope to see you soon. Okay, thank you, Lawrence. It's been wonderful to talk to you and you matter. (laughs) Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.